Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this episode I want to talk about focus specifically as it pertains to real estate photography because there's two big challenges that we have when we're trying to do any type of focus for interior real estate photography. They both rely heavily on not just depth of field for what would be in focus because we want a lot in focus compared to if you're doing portraits with a shallow depth of field. We want in real estate photography a lot of stuff in focus but we've got a problem in that we also have to work with lighting so if you have a lot in focus if you've got a long depth of field and you're using a smaller aperture a, a higher f number that means that you're going to require a lot more flash power. So there's this balance that we have to do. And so I want to discuss some of that today to try to nail down some of the challenges and some of the things to consider for some of the best approaches for doing focus for interior real estate photography. Balancing this, we can tend to have one of the worst things that we don't want in interior real estate photography, and that's color casts that are caused by our flashes. If we get a lot in focus, if we've got then a broad depth of field by using a small aperture high F number, then with all that flash power that would be required, we're inevitably going to get colors casting off of the floor, off of furniture, the walls, the paint, the ceiling, all that's going to start getting some unwanted color casts on there. So we have to be able to balance that out. Especially though on top of that, we're taking a look at a challenge in the depth of field based off of what type of rooms we would be shooting. Taking a look at this big room here, if we were to use the typical 18 millimeter focal length, let's say, to try to capture this whole thing, we could use a f7.1 because even if we focused at about 10 feet away, then we're gonna have a depth of field from 3.5 to infinity, and we're not gonna require a whole lot of flash power to be able to overcome the ambient artifacts. We're still gonna get a very good depth of field. But when we go into a smaller room like this bathroom, that's when things get trickier. So if we were to use that same type of focus there at, uh, let's say we were focusing now at about 10 feet, at 3.5, we're not gonna see that sink closest to the camera in focus at all. If we did focus on that sink and we kept our aperture at, let's say that F7.1, then we're only gonna have a depth of field of 1.8 to about 3.3 feet, which is too shallow. So you can focus a little farther away, let's say at three feet, but if we still kept using f7.1 to once again conserve some of the flash power and reduce color casts, we're talking about a depth of field of 1.8 to 7 feet, which is better. The sink will probably be in focus, but a lot in the distance won't be. So that's when we have to consider things like, okay, not just a little farther away on our focal point, but then using a smaller aperture, say f9, which would then get us a depth of field between 1.7 and 12 feet, which would get this entire bathroom in focus. But now what we've done is we've introduced a lot more flash to accomplish this and with a colored bathroom like this we could start getting a lot more color casts coming off things and onto the paint onto the walls and now we've got our own lighting challenges there. So that's just one example of many that we're up against shooting interior real estate photography, always trying to balance where should I focus? What should be in focus? Am I gonna have problems with using too much flash? Am I still gonna be able to control the ambient artifacts? Because obviously you could use a lot less flash if you raised your ISO, but when you do that, now you've got a problem of too much ambient light that could be possibly coming in. So there's a long, huge discussion on this that gets very much in detail. It's something that I cover throughout my real estate photography series, and especially in the interiors book. I've got a link to that down in the description for this video, which talks about a lot of things for interior real estate photography, including this subject. Here though, what I want to do is concentrate on the techniques for applying these types of focus points and what we're focusing on, how to do that with modern cameras and older cameras as well, because that also gets tricky. We've got a variety of different focus techniques that can be offered through these cameras. So which ones work best? Which ones should you be using? That's what I'm gonna cover here. I'm gonna go through various things with autofocus. I'm gonna cover various things with manual focus so we get a better understanding of what we're really up against. So as you know, focusing falls under 
two main options, especially when it comes to doing anything with stills. And I'm not talking about all the various stuff where you've got eye tracking and some of the great focusing options that are there for doing action and also some portrait work too, especially when it comes to kids that you can detect the eye and follow them around. But when we're doing interior real estate photography, there's really two options. It's either autofocus or manual, but even then there are a lot of options. No matter what, they all have one big thing in common that's so often overlooked, and I can't stress this enough, is that you need to have focus validation. You need to make sure that when you're focusing, you really are focusing on what you want and that you what you want in focus is really in focus. And this is not just a matter of, let's say using focus peaking or something else. There's other methods we really have to take into consideration whether we're using autofocus or whether we're using manual focus. Some of the newer features in mirrorless cameras, which I'll show a little bit of here in just a little bit, the focus peaking and also some of the focus indicators, those are great because they're new features that haven't been available in the past. And I know a lot of people are just drawn to that, but to me, it's more of a toy because they're not always accurate. The thing is, whether you're using anything inside the camera that's relying on its electronics and its sensor, whether it's focus peaking, whether it's the focus indicator light, whether it's the autofocus itself and the color of the focus point, those type of things that are purely electronic, well, you're left up to just the camera figuring that out. So if you were using autofocus and you wanted to validate it, autofocus being an electronic uh, element within the camera itself, a feature within the camera that's relying on the camera's electronics, sensor and whatnot, validating it with just focus peaking or an indicator is like the fox watching the hen house. It still falls under that same umbrella of the same mechanisms that are used for the initial autofocus. Now, manual focusing, when I get to that, I'll be able to show that, and that might be more helpful, but for autofocus, focus peaking and all that doesn't matter, and that's one of the reasons why you won't find autofocus peaking in a lot of cameras. Focus peaking is usually applied to manual focus only because the camera, once again, is using its focusing mechanisms and its algorithms in a certain way for doing autofocus. And just by showing peaking, it's then just duplicating. It's a redundant feature in there. So instead, my highest recommendation, I know this is gonna sound old school, and I know you're gonna call me grandpa for this, but I love to use, whenever possible, a focus window. And a lot of lenses in the past had focus windows. The Takina 16 to 28, that has a focus window. That's one reason why I like using that. Because as I use it, I can tell, after it gains some type of focus, am I really there? I've had so many times on especially some of the newer lenses where they don't have focus windows and you think you're in focus, you get back and unfortunately it didn't quite grab auto focus properly. And this is an error that can occur on any camera. I don't care if you have a Nikon, if you have a Canon, Sony, Fuji, Olympus, it doesn't matter. There will come a time. If you rely purely on the electronics of your camera to do autofocus, it will be wrong at some point. A focus window is very helpful if your lens does have it. If not, well, that's another thing you have to really look closely at. Even some of the newer lenses for the Z line, they're very expensive, the F2.8 lenses mostly, those will have focus windows, but like a lot of Sony lenses, they just don't have them anymore. They're just not there. They're relying heavily on other mechanisms and other features that they would have inside the camera. Once, ago, once again, those are relying purely on electronics, there is no 100% sure way to tell that you've got a mechanically distanced area. So it's all just what the camera detected, not what you can measure and what you can see. So you'd be missing that validation part, but an easy thing to do is just to zoom in. So you can, a lot of these mirrorless cameras, you can zoom in while you're focusing. You can also just take a test shot and then zoom in, move around and make sure that things are in focus. So now I want to get into the nitty gritty. I want to get behind the lens. I want to be able to show you in the menus a few different options, things when we're talking about autofocus and when we're talking about manual focus, my recommendations and also some of the things that you may have seen, may not have seen and some of the limitations of the various options that you have for both categories of focus.
So starting here, looking at autofocus off the Nikon Z5, the Z6, Z7, it's the same, Sony cameras, Fuji, Canon, they all have similar functionality here for what I'm going to be showing. And what I suggest right off the bat is that when you're doing autofocus, and of course this is a great example because we have a lot of things that could be in focus in the far room, what we're doing near here. So what you want to try to do if you have the option is to use autofocus single with a pinpoint. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So on the Nikon cameras and most cameras, you'd have AFS, some type of single autofocus that would set a single autofocus point. You don't want to have it on continuous. You don't want to have it on manual. You want to make sure that you're using single autofocus. And then for the area, a lot of times that area by default on older cameras is just single point autofocus. So if you selected single point autofocus, then your focus point is going to be large. You can see that red box is really quite large. And what that means is when I try to focus on something, it's going to take a lot of things into account. If I tried to focus here, for instance, it's going to try to get the sink and that bottle in there. If I tried to get something that was a lot closer, is it going to be getting the faucet? Is it going to be getting the handle? So these things, it's trying to focus and it did find something that was fairly reasonable. So a lot of times that will work, but if you want something more accurate, it does take a little bit more seeking on your camera is to use pinpoint if you have it. So unlike the Nikon cameras, there's pinpoint autofocus. Now this, all that it does is make that focus area a lot smaller. So now I can say, yep, I just want that handle to be my focus point and I can focus there and boom, I'm green. It focused just fine. So that's good. Then I can decide any other focus point point that I want. Now, when we're talking about zooming in and trying to confirm what we have. Now with this, I'm using the Takina 16 to 28 F2.8. It's got a focus window on the top that I can see what's happening just fine. But if I didn't have that, what I'd want to do is get rid of this display, go into here where I'm pretty much just seeing just the image itself. And then I might want to zoom in. Then I can zoom in here and I can then start seeking around and going, okay, am I really in focus? By focusing on that, I can see over here, yeah, I was a little too close so I can, can't make out the lettering, for instance, on the CeraVe bottle. And if I were to take a look at the room, which once again, doesn't have to be completely in focus, but that just looks really soft and it's way out of focus. So that can give me confirmation, which once again, you can see though that I'm up against that battle of light versus the aperture. So how much is in focus here using F7.1 is one thing. Let's say that we brought that up to F9. Now that means that I've got to lower the shutter speed. I'm also going to need to use a lot more light on this. But now as I focus on something, and let's say that I just take something that's kind of in between. Let's focus on something, say uh, that Kleenex box, for instance. So I'll just move my focal point over there. Then if we autofocus on that, Okay, that's pretty good. Now if I zoom in, let's check out what all's in focus. So here I can see that, yeah, the Kleenex box is in focus, it should be. That faucet, pretty well in focus, well focused enough. Go over here to the other sink, which is very important. We can see that that CeraVe bottle is much more in focus, and obviously then that sink is. And once again, you're seeing here just a capture card out of the camera, so it's not going to be, you know, the sharpest thing looking. If we take a look at the room here, some of that's going to be soft, but it will be a little better in focus, so not as bad. But this is what I'm talking about validation. I'm able to validate this using the focal distance window on the Takina lens, which is fantastic. I can see where I am and that I'm at about the distance that I think that I'm focusing. I can then validate that enough stuff is in focus. Now, using F9, I could also, if not enough stuff is in focus, I could change that focus point. Let's move that focus point to something, in fact, just a little farther away. So let's move that focus point, for instance, to that far sink. And you can see the pinpoint focus now is over here across that far sink. So let me focus there. And looking at the focus distance window, I can see that we definitely got a few more feet in there. So we can validate that by zooming in. And sure enough, that's sharp. If we go over here to the other sink, is that going to be sharp? And we see that it's acceptably sharp. In fact, not bad, a little bit soft, but you can still make out Kleenex on that Kleenex box. Now, if we were to go all the way over to that room, we're probably gonna see a lot more of that in focus, because once again, using that smaller aperture of F9 gets us a much greater depth of field. And sure enough, we can see that a lot more, this is a lot sharper than in that far room. So those are the things about validation that can really help.
So those are just a few high level techniques, but the bigger one when it comes to autofocus, besides using pinpoint if you got it, definitely uh, focusing on something where appropriately it should be to get a good depth of field, is to use what's known as back button focusing. And what back button focusing is, it's a matter of separating your shutter release from your focusing. So most times by default, you would uh, be pressing your shutter halfway down to focus, but and, and before you do then, it would be able to take a picture. But what we want in this case is to completely separate that so that each time you take a frame, it's using the same focus. It's a very simple thing to do. I'll show you how to set it up in the Z5. And there's an easy enough way to do this for even the older Nikon uh, D610s, for instance, or you, know, you can use it on Canon, Sony. They all have just a little bit of a difference on setting up back button focusing. But the idea here is, is that you'd find a focus point, you use a button on the back of your camera. In this case, for the Nikons, it's the uh, A. F on button on the newer Z lines. And then once you have your focus set, you have confirmed it, you just start taking pictures. So frame after frame after frame is using the exact same focus. So your ambient shot, your flash shots, your window pulls, your shower pops, etc., are all using the same focus. You don't have to worry about them focusing on something else or not grabbing focus when they need to. So let me show you how this is set up, for instance, in the Z cameras. Go into your menu system for any Z camera and you want to go to the custom setting menu and select autofocus. Scroll down to A7, which is AF activation. It'll say off, don't worry about that. Select that. When you do, by default, it's going to have shutter AF on. And what that means is that the shutter and the AF on button can be used for focusing. What you want is AF on only. And then by going using your right, and you just select enable. Once that's enabled, that's all you have to do. And now your back button focusing is enabled. Half pressing your shutter button won't do anything. Your focusing is completely relied on just using that AF on button only. So the next topic, taking a look at manual focus. It's something that I'll do with these, this Takino lens so you can see how that works there are some great manual focus only lenses, and you might have to do this, for instance, with a tilt shift lens. Most tilt shift lenses are not autofocus. There's some, and a lot of the wide angle fisheye lenses, if you're doing, for instance, virtual tours, you're not gonna have that uh, luxury of autofocus as well. So knowing that, that can be very uh, helpful for some of the manual focus techniques, no matter what it is that you're gonna be doing. Now, once again, using a focus distance window on a lens is great, but a lot of these manual focus lenses go further than that. As you can see here, this is a Liowa 12 millimeter zero D lens. I like to use this for video especially. And it has also the focus zones that shows you what your depth of field is. So right off the bat, you really don't need a whole lot of validation in the camera because you know where it should be focusing at what distance and then what should be acceptably in focus. Obviously though, you could still do a lot of the, uh, the validation if you wanted to. But the more common one is known as focus peaking. And that's something that we've got in the Z camera, Sony, Canon, all the mirrorless lines have this. And it can be a useful feature. Let's take a look at that real quick. Setting up focus peaking on a Z camera, very similar to other cameras on the Nikons, the Z line, it's going to be under your custom menu called peaking highlights. When you select that, you can select what your peaking level is, kind of the sensitivity for it. Let's do a very high sensitivity, number three. So we'll select that, and then you can also select the peaking highlight color. More often than not, it's red, that's what's by default, and this can really help to see what you're up against. So once that's done, then we're gonna see something different when we look through the viewfinder of the camera. So this is what it looks like, and you can see all these red lines. Those red lines are edges that it felt were detected as being in focus. And of course, using this aperture of f9, as we saw, using our depth of field and being able to calculate this out and seeing firsthand with our validation that, yeah, a lot of that should be in focus. If we start changing our aperture down though, and we'll just increase our shutter speed so we don't get blown out here, some of those lines will go away, especially if we were to really reduce that aperture we'll get this up here, then some of those lines should go away. But as you can see, it's not all that accurate. Here, I'm gonna get down to about 
Now at this point here, I should not have much in focus. Now some of the near stuff went away, but what allows me to do now is let me go back to a more reasonable aperture and I'll just use f7.1 as an example. Let's get our shutter speed down here so it looks about normal. Now, what I can do here is I can start changing the focus. I'm moving my focal ring, and as I do, those lines are appearing and disappearing. So I can see what all's in focus. Now, this can be helpful, but it still doesn't replace knowing what my depth of field should be. Because once again, this is just making a best guess. And right now, my focal ring is basically set to infinity. So I know at f7.1 that that front sink is going to be out of focus. So if I go over there to take a look at that front sink, look at the Kleenex box, you can even see the word Kleenex is out of focus. We can see here that that's completely out of focus. It's very soft. If we zoom back out and see the lines though, we see there are red lines around those edges telling us that's in focus, but it's really not. So this is one reason I really don't care for focus peaking. I found it actually be more of a toy than something useful when it comes to doing interior real estate photography. Now there's something else here too when you're in focus mode and that's the focus point indicators. So if you have a native lens then for instance, either on your camera, if it's a Canon camera and you've got a Canon lens, Sony camera, Sony lens, in this case, a Nikon camera with a Nikon lens or uh, one that is compatible. For instance, the Takina 16 to 28 has compatible electronics with the Nikon uh, Z cameras through the FTZ adapter. What you can do is you can move your focal point to where you need to. For instance, I'm moving this big focal point around and seeing what's in focus. And it's staying green, but you can see there it turned red because it's out of focus. If I change this now, I'm gonna focus a lot closer and it stays red. I'd have to move that focus point over to something a lot closer for it to start turning green. So let's get it in here really close and then I can focus until I see that turn green. Now I know that's probably in focus, but there's something else. If we look down here in the bottom left, it's what they sometimes call the meatball. It's that little uh, dot. If I go way out of focus where I was before, that goes away and instead there's an arrow saying, turn to the right, turn to the right. And as I do, boom, the meatball shows up. If I go too far the other way, it's gonna go, go to the left, go to the left with that other arrow until I come back and I can see the meatball come into place. So this can be helpful too, but once again, as I was saying earlier, is that this mechanism, the focus peaking, as well as the autofocus, they all rely on similar mechanisms. And I don't really find either this particular method that useful or the focus peaking. So once again, if you're going to be doing manual focus, think about getting a manual focus lens. Ones that show not just your focus window, but also has the depth of field scale on it. So you can see what's going on because you, you will get very close and then you can always zoom in to see if you really are in focus to do your focus validation. Well, I hope this video was useful for you and that you can apply some of this to your photography as well. If you did like this video and you'd like to see more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, <laughs> it won't cost you anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.